For many years, as I'm sure many of you know, Indira was a familiar and much-loved face on our screen reading the nightly news on SBS. Back then, the world seemed a little bit less of a mess if Indira was telling you about it. In her personal life, Indira is a cricket tragic and a great home cook. Her journey of resilience came about through reinventing herself and finding new meaning, purpose, and joy on the small balcony of her inner city home. Please welcome Indira. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Caro. Um, and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight um, and um, um, acknowledge uh, their elders, both past and present and emerging. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember my days of uh, reading the news on both SBS and ABC, uh, that was now almost 20 years ago. Yes, we've all <laughs> aged quite a bit since then. Um, and I, I do find it hard to believe that so much time has actually passed because they were um, very seminal times for me. Uh, there was a lot of amazing global um, conflicts and, and events going on at that time, um, a very important time that laid the foundation, sadly, for a lot of the conflicts that we're now going through globally. But what happened for me covering a lot of those international stories is that I realised um, the narrative as news journalists and broadcasters that we were giving our audience wasn't really giving the full picture. Um, I think what news does really well is it tells you what's going on. What it does really badly is it doesn't tell you um, how to fix things and how to make things better. So I found as a storyteller that I was giving my audience the, the heavy weight of the problems of the world, but not really giving them much insight in what they could do to rectify it. And I was feeling that very personally as the person giving this information. So I decided to take some long service leave and explore the world as it really was, rather than the world through through a journalist's eyes, which can be a little jaded um, at times. And um, we're isolated too, physically in a lot of ways, where our news gathering services and buildings are. We really are very removed from the community, um, from the community that we're meant to be connected with and understanding. So I spent some time traveling um, through Asia and Europe, but not as a journalist. Um, I changed the lens, and I think that that's so important to do when we get stuck in, in looking at the world through one particular set of premises. And I just thought, I'm going to try to be as normal as I can and um, just be um, like everyone else. Uh, so I um, hung out with farmers, I hung out in schools, school teachers, uh, just trying to see what was really happening. And as I discovered, we were missing big parts of important stories in the news media. I um, decided when I came back to Australia that I wanted to explore world issues and conflicts, but not through the eyes of a journalist. And I got a posting with a UN agency in Geneva and started looking at global food programs because I could see that so many of the conflicts that were happening around the world were being driven by food and water shortages more and more. Um, and we're finding that obviously now, 20 years later, that's it's at the, ba the um, foundation of so many conflicts, even what's going on at Syria at the moment. We don't cover it very well in the news, but that, f that um, conflict was driven a lot by a serious drought that happened at the same time as the rise of ISIS, forcing farmers to leave their drought-affected farms into the cities and into the hands of ISIS. But again, the media doesn't really cover that side of the story. And when I'd finished my um, time at the UN, I realised that um, this had to be the foundation of every news story that I told. It had to come from um, how we could fix the food and water shortages um, and, you know, um, and try to find a, a peaceful solution to conflicts through those, um, through those filters. And at the same time, uh, the issue of climate change was becoming a lot more, um, uh, people were aware of it. I was lucky enough to be selected by um, Al Gore as a climate change presenter. And that, again, was another big change in my awareness. I realised that now, um, as we are finding, that climate change was going to make those food and water crises even worse than we would ever imagine and make those conflicts around them even worse as well. So when I came back to Australia, after being armed with this new insight, um, into what was driving conflicts. I stood on my little balcony in Potts Point on the 13th floor, 20 square metres, 
And intellectually, I felt I understood the, the, the drivers, but I didn't understand um, in how this affected me as an individual. Because as an urban dweller, like a lot of us, we have lost contact with nature in our urban settings. Um, I didn't know how food was grown. I didn't really have a lot of time to cook my own meals. Um, I didn't know any farmers or growers in, in this urban environment. And um, as in, f in, in terms of growing food or being connected to birds and animals and insects, I mean, that, that was something that, that, you know, I didn't think was possible in that environment. I went to a farmer's market one day and the farmer offered me a delicious sweet um, tomato and I popped it in my mouth and it was the most delicious tomato I have ever remembered eating. It was sweet and juicy with a crispy, um, juicy shell. And I realised that that was what I needed to connect with. I went back to my balcony and I had this epiphany moment. I was going to turn that small balcony into a veggie patch. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never gardened, I'd never grown anything before. My husband thought I was mad. Most of my friends thought I'd flipped a lid too. And I live above a Woolworth, so it just didn't make sense to my neighbours. Why would you want to grow an eggplant that took three months to grow when you had them underneath, grow, you know, for free, almost, 10 cents sometimes. Um, but I realised that there was going to be some connection I was going to learn from the process. So I rang Peter Cundall at Gardening Australia and he told me about putting some manure and you know, soil in pots and lugged it up there and put in a few seeds and honestly I had no idea what I was doing. I, I didn't know how successful it was going to be. But I was, I was determined to be present and be connected and, and try to learn and understand as much about the process um, as my plants were willing to teach me. And shock horror in that first year, I managed to grow 70 kilos of produce on that small balcony, uh, 43 different herbs and vegetables. Uh, there's some sorrel um, that Kylie um, asked me to bring along tonight that we served from my balcony. Um, yeah, great fun. And um, everything I grew um, ended up tasting in better than anything I've, I'd um, had before in supermarkets, even some farmers markets, because it was so fresh. Uh, I m amazed myself probably more than anyone else because how was I able to do this? I didn't think I had the special skill set required. But then the more I, I, I watched and learned, I realised that 100 years ago, each and every one of us was doing this. We were growing our own food, cooking our own food, and only in 100 years we'd moved away from this. How had we lost these very, very key, important life skills. So it led me to write a book called The Edible Balcony about how to grow food in a small space. That became a bestseller. My beautiful publisher, Julie Gibbs, is here, who guided me through that process. And um, it led to my second book, The Edible City, which is about my beautiful association largely with the Wayside Chapel and the lovely vegetable garden that we built on the rooftop of the Wayside Chapel. 200 square metres of beautiful fresh produce just up the road from where I live in Potts Point. And, um, we also put in some beehives and that honey Kylie uses in her uh, pork buns at Billy Kwong. So it's a beautiful community connection that all these growing adventures have had in my community. Um, what I've learned from it, I think, is my early life um, now I realise was one of extreme resilience, really. Uh, I grew up in South Africa. My parents were Indian South Africans. We lived in five different countries before I was 13. And I realise now that a lot of what I'm applying to how um, I look at, at resolving and solving global conflicts is from that very early resilience that I was taught um, from moving countries and adapting to new environments and new countries and cultures since I was very young. So I'm very fortunate now that um, this this um, garden has become a wonderful foundation for travelling the world and lecturing and talking and sharing skills with other people living in urban, wasted urban spaces that don't think that they can grow their own food. We are helping refugees, um, indigenous communities, homeless communities around the world to convert these wasted spaces. So um, for me, it's precious because it's... Um, ensuring resilience um, right at the core of the, the heart of every community because when you have a safe food supply, uh, that resilience is, is um, much more guaranteed. So it's a wonderful journey that I've been on um, and a wonderful journey that so many people that I've um, got in this room actually has shared with me and helped me and taught me along the way. So thank you very much. Um, it's um, been a, a wonderful, resilient journey, so thank you.